Hey everyone, it's Heather Garnall. Welcome back to my art channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. So the fall season is rapidly closing and I wanted to go back and do an acrylic pour. Um, and I wanted to keep it fall themed or fall related. However, when you think about the fall colors, they're very warm and there's nothing wrong with warm colors. They are beautiful, but they don't always complement each other, you know, like the reds, oranges, yellows, and browns and then mixed with some greens on top of that. It's just off the top of my head, that just sounds like, oh, who would do that, you know? But then I thought, well, you know what, why not? Because when you see the grand scheme of all the fall colors throughout the scenery, you know, that God um, gives us to witness, they actually all do go together quite nicely. And so I thought, let's see how it comes out on a canvas. But before we get started, today's ministry snack comes from the Gospel of John, chapter nine, verses one through three, and it reads, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now the Gospel according to John was of course written by one of his disciples, and so as it says in verses 1 and 2, As he passed by, he, as in Jesus, saw a man blind from birth. So in chapter 8, um, Jesus was having some issues with some Pharisees or religious leaders. And this was around the time of the Feast of the Tabernacle, I believe. Anyways, so the Pharisees were super infuriated with him. They were just furious to the point they were literally picking up stones to stone him on the spot, believing him to be a false prophet. And so they were just taking matters into their own hand. And Jesus wasn't having that, so he just, he left. Um, and so this is this scene coming on, which is when he passed by because he left and on his way out, he saw this blind man from birth, which is the um, introduction of chapter nine. And so as it continues to say, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, which is another uh, word for a Jewish scholar or teacher, although the disciples didn't really look at Jesus like a scholar um, because uh, the, the Pharisees were more scholar-like because they had much higher education, their knowledge in the law was above pretty much everybody else's. So therefore that kind of gave them that um, separation in status, I guess. But the disciples really looked at Jesus more as a teacher, um, a little bit more personal because he personally taught them the word of God and how to live out the word of God. Um, and so that's where I personally believe that that makes more sense as far as calling him or looking at him more like a teacher. So of course it goes on to say, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? So take note that his students are asking great questions. This is a great question. After all, so many people are born with disabilities and they're not, there's not just one or two types of disabilities out there, but a multitude of disabilities. So in other words, he's asking, hey, is he being punished in this specific way because he made some really bad choices in life? Or is he taking the hit because his parents made some really bad choices in life, therefore the result fell on him type thing? Well, at first, if I was asking him, obviously not knowing, I'd assume it was his parents, you know, because if he was born blind, does it make sense because he didn't really have a chance to make bad choices, it just kind of came out like that, you know? Uh, so to me, it would make more sense to ask who sinned if he wasn't born blind. Now moving on to verse three, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. Now brace yourself because this is intense and as usual, I'm long winded. So as you can see that Jesus debunked the theory that this guy was being punished because that he was a sinner or that his parents were sinners or have sinned. So take note that we are all sinners um, and that's plastered all over the Bible to keep us in check, you know? Um, also preventing us from jumping on the prideful bandwagon, which is a dangerous thing to ride on. But anyways, but the most short and sweet reminder that comes to mind when I think of how we're all sinners comes from the book of Romans, which was written by the Apostle Paul. So in the book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 23, it says, All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. So no one gets a free pass and no one will ever get a free pass. Not even the Virgin Mary herself was perfect, you guys, except Jesus, because not only was he fully God, but he was fully man. Um, now, she was a good woman and was specifically hand-selected by God because Mary had found favor in the eyes of the Lord, which is why he personally tasked her to be the earthly mother of Jesus. Now, before we move on to the rest of the verse, let's think about why some people are born 
with disability so that this part of the verse sinks in even more because there is still a lot to unpack. So, I mean, it is super common to believe that God would punish us, you know, and give us a specific disability or even a specific sin, you know, especially if we know we've been distant and disobedient. I mean, my kid knows that there's some punishment coming, um, especially if he knows he's been acting up, although that's not always the case as far as punishment coming. So that, that makes sense to have that mindset that punishment is coming um, by the hand of God if we know we've been acting up. However, get this, that's the mindset we have when we're not close to Jesus. A lot of us think that we're all close and intimate and everything, but if that's our mentality, yeah, we're not as close as we think we are to him. So first off, God never issues us our sin ever at any point in our life. We are lured into it simply by temptation given to us by the enemy, by Satan. And when we can't resist that temptation, then we sin. But temptation alone isn't what makes us a sinner. Um, it's the act, or in other words, if we carry out that temptation. I mean, Jesus was tempted for 40 days with Satan all up in his personal space, you know, giving him any and every temptation, hoping he would fail. But of course, we all know that God is no failure and is why he says to go to him when we are tempted. Um, because through Jesus, we can get through the temptation. He gives us that power. And he also gives us that sense of urgency to pray over our kids because Satan does not just target adults. He'll go as young as possible. So no matter what sin you do or live by, God does not make you born with a sin, unlike how someone can be born blind. Those are completely separate issues. Um, although food for thought, some of you also might remember um, how John, the same disciple who's writing this gospel, also mentions in chapter one, verse 29, how he um, documents uh, John the baptizer, who's also Jesus's cousin, when he sees him, or when John the baptizer sees Jesus coming, John the baptizer says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let me underline that word away. Not, oh my gosh, behold, here comes this man who brings us the sin of the world. That's Satan's arena, bringing all the junk and confusion of the world because he rules the earth. That is why he is known as the Prince of the Earth. Only he wants us to think that Jesus is a liar, a failure, and oh, that he contradicts himself too to keep us distant from Jesus and so that we won't be saved. So that covers that God does not divvy out our sin. We just take it all on ourselves when we refuse to seek the help of our savior. Now, like I mentioned, we are somehow convinced that God still punishes us today for our behavior. I mean, I know I've thought like that before I was saved, but again, that's not always the case at least not today, as far as God or him punishing us today when we act up. So we could look back at the book of Job as a great example, but, or if you're not familiar with the book of Job, basically God let Satan do a number on Job because Satan was convinced that the only reason why that Job worshiped God is because God immensely blessed Job and said, I bet if you take everything away, he'll curse you. And so therefore is why God said, go right ahead. Let's see how that works out. Um, all Again, all to prove to Satan that Job would forever be a faithful servant. So anyone who thinks that they have it bad probably haven't read Job. And once you do, immediately you'll fall on your face in Thanksgiving and just count all your blessings. I mean, I still do, just the very thought of what happened. And so since God is omniscient, he's all-knowing, is why he allowed all of those harsh circumstances to take place in Job's life. Just like how he allows all of our harsh circumstances to take place, all to build character and faith. Now, Job ultimately did become super confused and distressed, of course. I mean, hello, he's human. But his three friends definitely weren't helping the situation as they kept telling him in a roundabout way, come on, man, look at you. You're a train wreck. You're like a walking disease over here. Surely you sinned. You, you, you must have done something. I mean, nobody suffers like you are unless you're an evil person. Just fess up already, you know? Gosh, you guys, what? Personally, those are crummy friends. Instead, those friends should have been like, hey, man, I don't know what's going on. Let's pray together. You know, I, I'm here for you. I hate to see you like this. Your burdens are my burdens. You know, and my heart is suffering with you. 
really those that's how all of our friends should be we should have friends that bless and not blame you know what i mean uh, so the end of the story goes that god ultimately restored everything that job had had and even then some as in like 10 times more because god knew that job would always be the faithful servant that he was so as you can see a lot of us still have the mentality of job's friends you know where something bad's going on in life we still think you know oh i must have said this one thing or did this one thing or things you know but god does not currently punish us now take note of the word currently he does not currently punish us and he does not give us our sin either ever god is graceful and merciful slow to anger and compassionate he never changes the only thing that he changed as in past tense are the covenants going from old to new but because he's slow to anger and compassionate is why we are still around today when he should have and could have just wiped us out already but he is still currently trying to chase our hearts so that we won't send ourselves into punishment mode which is a self sentence into hell when we deny christ so all this time passing is simply the grace of god giving us daily chances to repent hence the gift of a new day um hoping that we will have a change of heart you know and all by our own wanting not that anybody was forcing that on us so it's not that he's weak or too afraid to you know unleash his fury he's gonna do that anyways you know and that too is also plastered all over the bible but for now again the fact that we are still here is just him showing how loving and compassionate he is but more so how patient he is so when you think that someone is so horrible and you know it's quite obvious just think He's being patient for that person too to change, not just me, you know what I mean? Or not just you. He's waiting for everybody. He's giving everybody that chance. Now, speaking of those chances, how sad is it that there are so many souls in hell who would do and give anything for one more chance? Yet there are so many people on earth just wasting millions of chances. Now, as far as God punishing us, back in the Old Covenant or Old Testament, so before Jesus, yes, there were some pretty intense laws um, and punishment was sure to follow if the proper sacrifices weren't done. Uh, although there were some things that you simply couldn't sacrifice to save your butt, um, like claiming to be a prophet, saying that God sent you or sent them rather, um, all while misleading and misguiding people. That's referred to as being a false prophet um, or false teachers and sadly there's still a lot of those walking around today and that called for immediate death stoning to be specific at least in that case like how the Pharisees wanted to stone Jesus because they simply refused to believe that he was and is the Messiah so that was a big time offense to go around saying that you're a um, prophet when really you were not so the stakes were higher which is why death was surety to follow and you still don't want to misrepresent god at least not intentionally but all those laws and such can be found in the torah or also known as the pentateuch which are the first five books written in the bible also known as the law of moses because god had appointed moses to be the author of those books now side note i misspoke in a previous video and had said that the ten commandments are the law of moses however i also meant to word it um, how I just described it, that the law or the Ten Commandments are also found in the Torah, but it didn't come out like that. So I apologize if I get if I got my facts mixed up. So as you can see, nobody's perfect. Um, and I actually did put that in the comment section of that video too, so that there's um, clarity in that misunderstanding. But in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, also in the Torah, is where you're going to find all the specifics of those laws and things of that nature. Um, my opinion about those books, though, they're nothing short of being super dry and boring but if you have the steam to get through them i guarantee you all the lights will turn on you will feel the weight of god's wisdom blessed upon you and it's also just a great way to see how awesome we have it today compared to yesterday so to speak but anyway back then some punishment god did send down through several generations but because jesus's disciple was asking him was it his parents that sinned makes sense for that time so technically when he asked it was new testament or new rules apply 
Um, but these gospels weren't written yet because Jesus was still teaching his disciples as he's still teaching me and will forever be teaching me and you. Um, so he was still making his movement and his mission known and establishing his new covenant, which are the new rules. But in modern times, the question if it's a parent that sinned due to a disability as a punishment isn't applicable. Although to my understanding, the way that God would punish the generations back then wasn't by disability either. Rather, he would curse them and more like um, losing battles and living in extreme conditions, things of that nature. Now, as far as being born with a disability, well, let's go back to when God created the earth and all who dwell within it. So his creation was made with perfection. It was made and meant to reflect God because God is perfect in every way. Heaven was basically on earth and the earth and all that's in it was not supposed to die or be sick or have any kind of disabilities because none of those things were a part of his, of his perfect plan. Um, and we were also meant to be eternal, also reflecting God because he too is eternal. So all that said, he doesn't make anything by cutting corners. He doesn't make a lemon version of people or people with defects or disabilities. We think that he does so that we can think that he is imperfect and or just straight up mean. Just think when Adam and Eve chose to invite sin into the world. Again, I'm going to underline that word and emphasize it because it was a choice they made. God gave them free will as he gives us free will. He basically allowed them to make whatever kind of choices they wanted to have um, and he also warned them too that hey choices have consequences and choices have rewards depends on how you want to act anyways don't want to get away from the point but uh, the moment they chose to invite sin into the world was a game changer for everything and everyone in the world and basically a stopwatch started among other things so from that moment on heaven was then separated from earth and we are now no longer blessed to be in the physical presence of God, which is why it's so hard for so many people to believe that we have a God because he is invisible. Yet we believe that there's wind and then it's moving and then it goes in different directions and it has a purpose. So just saying, do the math. I've got to put two and two there. Hopefully that helps. Um, so then the earth started to decay. Our body started to decay. Even the moment we're born, you guys, we are immediately dying. I mean, as odd and weird as that sounds, that's just the fact. Hopefully we don't actually die until like, I don't know, like 90, 100 years or so after the fact. But death in general was now going to be a part of life after they ate from the forbidden tree or also known as the tree of knowledge and good and evil. So because of their choice, hardships were now going to be a part of life. Disabilities were also going to be a part of life. So when someone is not born normal, it's not because God lost his touch in creation, you know. To him, they're still normal. They're still perfect in his eyes. Thinking otherwise, we're essentially playing God with our prideful mindset. And as I said before, that is a dangerous ride to be on because we're only going to ultimately just be that bad egg and go <laughs> down the chute. But then we assume that these babies or people born with these hardships aren't good enough to live or they're going to be useless or forever be miserable type thing. And then how dare we put on the judgment hat on top of being prideful and do the unthinkable. You guys, I hate admitting this, but I have done the unthinkable in my past life, something I cannot take back but I am so glad I can move forward in the name of Jesus because he forgave me as he will forgive you when you genuinely ask for it in his name. So here's a thought if you haven't had this already, but who are we to assume that God wouldn't bless these people too? Who are we to assume that he wouldn't give them gifts or not take care of them? So a quick noteworthy side story. I don't watch TV, but uh, back in 2019, I saw this post shared on Facebook about a man named Cody Lee, who is legally blind and autistic, as in like way on the spectrum too. Um, and so when you're, when I was listening to him speak or just looking at him in general, you would think um, that he's like, I don't know, two sheets to the wind or something because clearly he's not mentally all there. But he was on America's Got Talent. I don't know, maybe you saw it. So of course, we all know Simon, his face was like 
practically cross-eyed, you know, like, oh, great, this now, it's just a waste of my time type thing. Um, until this guy out of nowhere played the piano, in my opinion, better than Elton John and sang just as good as the opera singer Luciano Pavarotti. I mean, so yeah, go figure. And the guy won America's Got Talent. So over all the other normal people, these judges chose him. Or how about this guy named Nick Vujicic? I hope I'm saying his last name right. But anyways, another person born with a disability. His is very rare. It's called Tetra Amelia. Basically, he was born without arms and without legs. But guess what? The guy's married with four kids and his wife and all of his kids don't have disabilities to my understanding. I mean, you think the guy would be super miserable and all, you know, but God blessed him with an amazing family and he's out there living life to his fullest and he's preaching the gospel to top it off. Or what about Helen Keller? I know I'm just kind of throwing him out there and I swear this is the last example, but she is one I just can't not include, you know, but anyways, she was born in 1880 and so of course that long ago a lot of young people aren't going to know about her but she died in the late 60s i believe so she was born blind and deaf so she had it worse off than the man that jesus healed um, but she ended up being an author and an educator to help bless those who also have disabilities despite her own so you can see god blessed her too immensely so although this message isn't just about disabilities it is in part asking ourselves who are we to judge who is worthy of living and or leaving somebody out of anything just because they were born differently we have no idea what god's plan is for them and how he intends to bless them and or even heal them just because jesus isn't physically here to instantly heal us doesn't mean he can't heal us through prayer and if he doesn't heal us through prayer it's very likely that he has a very specific plan for ourselves if we are disabled or anybody else that's disabled, just as he did with those three ordinary people that I also mentioned. Clearly, he carried one all the way, being Helen Keller, and he's still carrying the other two as he will always carry us. Again, if anyone thinks otherwise, that's prideful thinking how we would assume to know how someone else's life is gonna turn out, you know? And on top of that, take any kind of action preventing his plans being revealed for them. So just wait until you're sitting front and center of our maker when he asks you, why'd you mess with my creation? Because there'll be no excuse. Now I know there's the question about those who were born with a disability because their mothers were very neglectful. Sadly, that was a choice that she made that had a very negative impact on her offspring, but God knows that was not by the child's doing or any child born with a disability with a neglectful mother or not a neglectful mother. Um, and even more reason why he would be front and center for those individuals who live harder than normal people do. Maybe you've picked up on it, but yes, I am definitely following through with Proverbs chapter 31, verse eight through nine, as it reads, open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously or fairly, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Now it's super important to remember not to mix up the words or the meaning of the words righteous and fair because we as humans being flawed, we tend to have in mind what we don't think is very godly or very righteous or justly um, because we wanna satisfy our own emotions. We wanna put our um, definition before what the Father's definition is. So always ask him for that discernment if you are not sure. Again, because when you don't, we're just back on the prideful bandwagon. We wanna avoid any of that mess. So there again, don't mix up those words. So the bottom line is for this portion of the scripture is that due to Adam and Eve is how and why it all went down. And God knew that Jesus had to come to save us before the stopwatch stops. Disabilities or no disabilities, healthy or unhealthy, baby or elderly, we are all special. We all matter to him. Even those still in the womb, because like I said, we are valued by him because we are his crowning achievement. So finally, on to verse three, and I know some of you are probably thinking, I think she forgot to get there. <laughs> but I told you there was a lot to unpack, but it, Jesus says, but the works of God might be displayed in him. I know there was so much in between the first half of the verse and now that it's kind of like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> Anyways, so clearly his mission was to do the works of the Father who had sent him, which also included healing this man. So. It was basically for all of everybody to see so that their beliefs 
and faith with him would be more solidified. Now, at a first glance, it can be very easy to interpret that this man was born blind or that God had pre-planned him to be born blind so that he'd have to live all these years and wait around for Jesus to come heal him type thing. No, I personally don't believe that's the case. Um, I believe that's not what we're meant to be fixated on, and yet that's the power of the enemy who will take everybody's mind who is not willing to be focused on the word, but yet um, do whatever he can to drift us from um, the importance of the word, which is what we're supposed to fixate on, the fact that Jesus made a blind man from birth finally see, and that it wasn't that he or his parents sinned either. Now, the rest of this passage is also another beefy segment because it talks about Jesus's healing on the Sabbath um, and how the Pharisees basically for no reason got all mad at this man who was healed and even more furious with Jesus because he healed the man. Oh, and on the Sabbath too. So they were just stirring that pot. Um, I know, totally stupid and definitely a message for another time. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm starting off using a 10 by 20 deep panel canvas, doing a split base with unbleached titanium and then a 50-50 mix of unbleached titanium and raw sienna to soften it up some, which ended up giving me sort of a caramel color. Now I'm going to spread out my colors and torch out the air bubbles. So for my colors, I'm going to lay down some crimson red, a cadmium yellow deep hue, a custom orange mix, a pearl golden hour, an iridescent orange, then some copper, a pearl olive green, and then some burnt umber for some contrast, some gold, and then I'm going to pour some more base colors down to help the paint flow better. And then real quick, I feel like my yellow's vanished, so I'm going to put a bit more cadmium yellow deep hue down. Now I'm blowing the colors together to mix, and then of course I'll blow them out. Oh my gosh, I can just pinch myself what beautiful fall colors. I would have never have guessed they would have worked so well together. I do wish there was a little more orange in it though, but I'll take it. I know my custom orange mix was on the darker side, so that's probably why it doesn't look like there was much orange in it and a lot more red. So, you know, oh well. The center is a bit heavy, so I'm gonna see if I can blow anything more out of that, which so far it looks good. But then that one section, I need to add more base color to see if it will flow a little bit better. Okay, good, that worked. So here I'm just blowing a bit more to stretch out my sections. I am so loving the cell reactions, but I am not digging the center. So I think I'm gonna spend the next minute or two and play around some, just get creative. Hopefully I don't make it worse.
So far, I'm really liking the tweaks, but as you can tell, the center has become more of a stumbling block. I'm trying to bring all the colors into one spot, sort of like in a spiral motion. Also to add some detail in there, but I end up putting down a multitude of colors, trying to get it the way I'm more satisfied with it. But as you know, that could take several minutes of just playing around, which isn't a bad thing. Um, it's really just, you know, it's not over until you say it's over. I will say I really like how I broke up each section a little more. I think it adds more detail in the composition. Okay, so after a hundred different swirls and colors, I got it the best way I could, and I am happy with it. I may go back with a brush when it's dry though, but anyway, the cells and the fall colors were a success, I think. So now, stand by for the dried result. Okay, so here it is all dried and I gotta say I think I was tweaking it too much. <laughs> Something I'm still learning to tell myself to just walk away sometimes, you know, just while you're ahead. Uh, I am telling you it is hard to pick which voice to go with as far as leaving it or keep going with it. But anyway, my working window was closing and honestly I needed a breather. So I figured just go back later with a fresh mind and use a brush which is what I ended up doing. Uh, sometimes walking away is the best thing because you do not want to start feeling any kind of negativity towards your work. You really need to keep a complete positive attitude the whole time and to maintain that positive attitude sometimes just means walking away. Anyway, so as you can see, I mostly enhanced the center embellishment and made minor changes to a few other areas as well. But all in all, I really like it. I'm glad I walked away um, to come back with a fresh mind and be pleased with the overall end result. So this piece reminds me of a breeze blowing. So given I used autumn colors, I'm gonna call this autumn breeze. I love the warmth in it, especially how those metallic accents came through. So before I sign off, I just wanted to say the artist creed with you for the next time that you wanna paint. You'll have something to keep your heart aligned with God's will and purpose for you in his gift of art. And it reads, I believe my talents are a gift from God and I am to use them to fulfill his purposes in my life and in his world. I humbly acknowledge and accept my gifts as I ask to receive God's vision for how I am to use them. I ask the Holy Spirit to free me from self-doubt and self-absorption. I pray this work will bring me into closer alignment with God's plan for me as I seek to bring my gifts and talents into his light and to become the whole and complete person he intends me to be. Amen. All right, so this concludes this demo. Paints and supplies are in the description for you, but if you liked it, please do me a kind gesture and share it as well as hit like and subscribe for more videos. But more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.